Good morning, Mr. President. Ah, good to see you again, Ray. You know, you've been doing working for the CIA for 27 years, and I know we've had a lot of ups and downs. Isn't this one of the craziest mornings? I mean, uh, here I am still the president of the United States. I do tell Netanyahu that he can't go in there anymore and the way he's going in, and the way he don't care. And he's got Congress on his side. He even got a big chunk of the media on his side. What what's happening? How bad is this? How serious it is? What's going on in, in, in the Gaza well, deal? Mr. President, let's start with that. That's what I had intended. I think uh, uh, probably the best way to describe the Israeli ruling uh, leaders there, their reaction to your stopping of that one shipment with the 2,000 pound bombs is to look at Ben Gvir, uh, one of the highest and senior uh, Israeli officials. Uh, I have a, a, a picture of uh, his uh, his reaction on the, on the, the face of the uh, Jerusalem Post, I believe. Uh, Max, could we show that one? Well, a, as we speak here, uh, the Israeli people are going into Gaza without any really stopping. They have asked uh, the Gazan, there he is, there's Ben Gavir. Uh, he's uh, saying, you know, Hamas loves Biden. Whoa. Uh, Smotrich, one of the other well, leaders. Who is, who is this guy anyway? I mean, he's, this is, he's uh, a the, top dog there. He's a, uh, he's ben, right ben Gavir, yeah, he's the uh, top, uh, top person next to Netanyahu. I think he's in charge of uh, national security. And Smotrich, also one of the big heavy hitters here, has made fun of your your uh, stop of this one shipment uh, of uh, the 2,000 pound bombs that can destroy a whole city. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, the other uh, aid flows in, the other arms aid. But they've made a big uh, kind of a joke out of this. And as a matter of fact, when you look at what uh, Blinken said uh, yesterday on a, a Sunday news show, you know, what he said was, well, uh, we could uh, continue that or even expand that stoppage. But right now we're sending everything in except those 2,000 2, uh, pound bombs and we'll continue to do that. So uh, people are having real trouble reading uh, what your mind is and how this is all going to come out with uh, Ben Gavir causing, uh, calling you uh, a favorite of Hamas and the Israeli leaders going willy-nilly, doing what they want to. But, but wait a minute, is he it. some kind of crackpot or something? He's not speaking for Netanyahu, for Bibi, is he? Well, he? I mean, Bibi wouldn't say something like that. I mean, I've been supporting these people forever, you know. Uh, yeah. and what does it mean? I mean, yeah, Bibi is hemmed in by these these uh, extreme rightists. So, uh, yeah, Bibi uh, would, would probably not say that, at least not out loud. But Ben Gavir is what you have to really contend with because Ben Gavir could uh, destroy the cabinet and then Bibi himself would be left to fend for himself with three, uh, three criminal trials against him once he leaves office. There was an interesting article uh, by in, in Haaretz um, by Ehud, Ehud Olmert, who used to be prime minister about 10 years ago. And uh, let's just read you, it's really quite quite interesting what he said about, uh, what he said about uh, 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 Benjamin Netanyahu's real motivation here. He says, uh, and this is a quote, uh, it's certainly customary to say that Netanyahu really wants to bring those hostages back, uh, but it's clear that uh, what he really wants is uh, is to make sure he stays in office and to quote here, it's clear, but that it's incongruent with Netanyahu's personal needs. So to free the hostages, to tamp down this war, to have a ceasefire is, in, in the words of Old Mouth, incongruent with Netanyahu's needs. Now that clearly means that Netanyahu will go to jail if he doesn't stay in office. And so he cares much less about what happens in Gaza than the fact that he keeps it going, 
and therefore stays out of jail. That's a very bald way of putting it, but it's not me this time. It's a former prime minister. You know, I noticed, Ray, you keep bringing up that Haaretz paper, but that's from the old Labor Party there, and, and they don't even exist. They're not even in the parliament of Knesset anymore. So, and and you got there in uh, Israel now, you got Sheldon Edelman. They, he's not with us anymore, but he doesn't, isn't his paper like the real big deal there? That's like it that. is, yeah. I they sound made more clear. like the New York Post or something, right? I mean, what, what are, and they, are they behind this Gavir guy? Yes, they are. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, Haaretz has limited influence. It's read by the intelligentsia or the people who really want to know what's going on. It's very, very outspoken, though. Uh, as a matter of fact, you don't have any you don't have any broadsheets like that in the United States. Just as a matter of curiosity, Haaretz says what lots of people think, and uh, the pity is, as you you're right, the reason sixty eight percent of the Israeli populace wants to do in the rest of the Palestinians is because they read Sheldon Adelson's and, and all the hard right uh, publications saying this is okay to do because somehow we have the divine right to cleanse our country from Palestinians. So you're right. Uh, but Haaretz is fairly interesting for Olmert to get in there and to say that, hey, this is the real deal here. Benjamin Netanyahu is not worried about much else than his own personal, how do you put it? His personal needs. So what's going on here? They, they, they want to finish me off? So they get Trump in and Trump will do whatever they want? Or But, but, but how bad is it today now? You know, come on now. It's, it's, it's a Monday and they weren't supposed to go in there in this way. Blinken told me they weren't going to do this. They were going to listen to us. And uh, then we had a threat of cutting stuff, stuff off. They can't use, but uh, what's going to happen? Is it all going to fall apart? You, you're talking now 35,000 people. Everybody keeps bringing up children, uh, women. You know, uh, they're comparing. They're using this word genocide all the time. That's obscene, isn't it? That's that's the disrespectful. That's anti-Semitic, actually. Congress, just, they, they passed that one. It's going to be anti-Semitic to, to say that. But still, you know, with this election, they're going to be telling me, I, I betrayed Israel, right? And then, then so if I say something against that, then I'm in trouble. The polls show I'm in trouble in these swing states where you're actually, amazing enough, we never heard about it before. You got people who are supposed to be uh, sympathetic with the Palestinians, you know, and a uh, whole new group there you're talking about. So uh, I'm, I'm between a rock and a hard place on this one. What do I Wait. do? What, 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 who's going to listen to me now? Tell me. You've been around a long time, right? Well, Mr. President, I can only fill you in on some of the media events and some of the other things that aren't exposed in the uh, in the mainstream media. And let me just quote a few here. I put them aside here. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, that uh, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield has been disinvited from, from one college, uh, Xavier University in Louisiana, which is the oldest, the oldest black college that is also Catholic in the United States, also from the University of Vermont. She was invited and then disinvited. So that's the tone of the times. Well, that's the Bernie, he, Bernie Sanders. Now, he he's cut and run on this thing here. You know, he's supposed to be the Jewish uh, senator. He was going to be the Jewish president. And, uh, you know, so he, he's making life miserable for me because he says it's a war against the Palestinians now. Uh, and, and, and then I'm, I'm, I'm looking like, a, you know, a bad guy here. But tell me what's going to happen on the ground. I, I, you know, enough about the, the politics. Are they going to start shooting up people? They, I saw something that, you know, huge numbers uh, getting off. But it takes you a thousand bucks to get a taxi out of there or something to get a tent. These even at that, you know. Famine, we're hearing all this, but is this all going to be my worst nightmare? Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, most uh, observers would say, uh, not crashly, but objectively, that's up to you. In other words, if Blinken keeps saying, oh, we're going to send all those arms except the really, the ones that destroy whole blocks of, of cities uh, and just the ones that destroy just half a block we're sending, uh, the signal given to 
uh, Netanyahu, Smutrich, and this Ben Gavir is just as in the past, we will not object to their doing what they want to do. And what they want to do, Mr. President, I hate to tell you, but there are more than a million people at the southern part of Gaza now. They're asking them to get out of the way, but there's no place to get out of the way. They're going to be all killed. They're going to be all injured. There's no place for them to go. And people are going to, these students are not going to stop objecting to that. And people are going to say, well, you know, this is a rock and a hard place. But uh, so far, as John Mearsheimer, the prominent uh, uh, political science says, uh, it will be uh, the Jewish lobby, the Israel lobby, that calls the shots here. And so far, with U.S. support, continuing support, voiced most recently yesterday by Blinken, uh, everyone will be able to see that when when you weigh the merits of this situation uh, and you look at your election, your decisions depend on that and not so much on what happens to these one million plus Gazans uh, subject to, you know, what you said genocide. Well, you know, that's a United Nations term that comes from the International Court of Justice, which said there's lots of evidence that's going on. There's a plausible genocide going on in Gaza, and that's three months ago. You know, Ray, it's, it's not that easy for me to make time in the schedule for these briefings, you know, and I know you, like, briefed uh, Ronald Reagan. He wouldn't get up most of the time, and you had to brief, you know, other folks, uh, you know, but I, I talk to you because you've been around so long, and you know so much of this, but people are starting to say you're a bit soft on all this, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's not just I want to do what's right for the country and I want to do what's right for for the people in Israel there, you know. But but uh, the, the fact of the matter is, if you don't like what I'm doing, you, you're certainly not going to vote for Trump. I mean, Trump's <laughs> attacking me all over the place. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I have to think about politics because I don't want to turn the country over to Trump. And if I don't play ball with, with Netanyahu now, and I agree, he's you know, he's got to survive politically. We all know about that. People trying to survive politically. But, you know, what's my what's my options here? What do I do? Now, cut off uh, arms? You say it's my choice? That's suicide, right? Well, Mr. President, uh, there comes a time when principle uh, often overshadows politics. Uh, in my view, this is such a time uh, one million plus people being eliminated, being blown apart. That's a lot on anyone's conscience. And uh, winning an election, of course, is also very important, especially a given your opponent. Uh, but I think that most people are looking at you now. And uh, I hope that John Mearsheimer, for the first time in his life, is wrong when he says that uh, you will always bow unequivocally to what the Israel lobby says, because that's the only thing that matters in terms of winning an election. Pardon me for being so frank, but it really is up to you. You could get on the telephone right now and stop the slaughter, stop the plausible genocide in Gaza. How's that? I mean, they got a lot of weapons over there in Israel. We've given them all this stuff. Even if I don't send anything, they certainly got the ability to, to wipe out civilians. I mean, there's no anti-aircraft force there with the Palestinians. They don't have any Navy. I mean, what are we talking about? Israel do whatever they want to do. And uh, so what is that? I can't stop that. You know, well, you can't. Uh, I can go and I can force aid in there. I can, you know, cross the border where we can send people. And that, that's something we've never uh, done, you know. And uh, as I say, I'm running against a guy now. I mean, wake up. I don't know. How close are you to retirement, Ray? Because, I mean, you don't, it's not like, a, I know you've given advice to presidents when they had to intervene, they had to be aggressive. Uh, you know, why don't you man up here? Are you really giving me the full choices or, or are you getting a little soft and, you know, in your old age? Well, Mr. President, uh, when I did brief President Reagan, uh, 241 Marines were blown up in Lebanon. He had a big choice to make. 
Does he double down? Or does he do what many of us thought the sensible thing was? Pull them out of there. Don't have them sitting ducks. Now, there are sitting ducks in Iraq, in Syria. There are sitting ducks all over the Middle East uh, that will be vulnerable to violent terrorists, terrorism, if you call, want to call it that, from Hezbollah, from Hamas, from all these uh, insurgent groups uh, that ha would have it in for the United States were you to acquiesce in the bloodbath that is coming that seems almost certain to come absent your telephone call in Gaza. It's very serious. And uh, why, are you bring up, why, are you, why are you bringing up Reagan? So what did he do? Well, he he, he was bombing uh, Lebanon. He was trying to, uh, and he, he had the battleships off the Mediterranean coast there, and they were bombing the hell out of Syria. And the uh, terrorists got through the Marine barracks and killed, if memory serves, 241 Marines. The flag was up. And Reagan had to figure out what to do. And what he did was not double down, but pull out. And that turned out to be a very wise move because once you're vulnerable like that, there you go, 1983, when you're really vulnerable like that, uh, you have to figure out what your equities are. And his equities were to pull back and to focus on other things like arms control agreements with the, with the Soviet Union at the time. So wait a minute, Reagan, are you now telling me it would have been called a pro-Russian, that Reagan was, uh, and Israel was would be down on him and condemning him? They did, actually, and he faced into it. Um, in other words, uh, there was a very sturdy uh, lobby at that point as well called APAC, the Israel lobby. Uh, they decried what uh, what Reagan ended up doing but he did it anyway, and it was the only sensible thing to do, many of us felt at the time. We didn't advocate uh, uh, what what to do. What we said was, if you double down, X, Y, and Z is going to happen. And that's what we're really uh, suggesting to you. If you look to day two, yes, you're right. The Israelis can decimate, can, can pretty much get rid of all those Palestinians in Gaza. But on day two... If there's no more arms, they are very vulnerable, as they have never been before since 1948. If the U.S. withdraws its support of arms support, economic support, uh, if it, in other words, uh, you're sitting in the catbird seat, Mr. President. Again, I'm not advocating anything, but I'm just spelling out your options, as we like to do in intelligence. If you do this, what? If you do that, the other thing. And if you, if you make that telephone call, uh, as night follows the day, uh, this will be the end of it because Israel cannot possibly survive without military support from the United States of America. Well, right. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be kind here, you know, because, I mean, uh, if it was anybody else, this would be our last conversation. Uh, and and I, you're correct. It's not your job to give me political advice. But when you say I'm in the catbird seat, um, it's clear you've never held office, let alone at this level. And, and you know, APAC, you're mentioning, it's not like they're not around now, right? And it's not just APAC. You got the whole U.S. Congress uh, beholden to them. Look at look what they're passing these days and everything like that. You're asking me to do something where the next resolution they pass is going to be for me to be prosecuted, you know, I mean, they're going to call me anti-Semitic and everything. And, and you know, what, what are you talking about? What kind of dream world do you live in? Uh, that's what's wrong with intelligence. Intelligence got to be practical. So tell me, of course, we're gonna, we have other things you got to talk about, but we're in a, a, a tense moment here now. Yeah. And if you were in this so-called catbird seat, yet you, you want to help the country by not letting Donald Trump become president, but, you know, sometimes I think maybe you're working with him or something because the, the way to ensure his election is for me to follow your advice right now. You know that, right? And so what what really could you do right now in the next 24 hours this week? What? Uh, Mr. President, with all due respect, I've been called a lot of things, but 
never a helper of Trump before, <laughs> please. Uh, well, uh, what I'm saying here is uh, when you've been around for a while and you know the story, the story of Vietnam, for example, uh, you know it or you, you've read about it. Now, what happened there was that the, in, the, the president was misled. LBJ was told that we were winning and we were losing. Whoa, sound familiar? The same exact thing is going on in Ukraine right now, okay? And what happened was there was a countrywide offense, offensive mounted by the Vietnamese communists in January and February of 1968 to the point where Johnson said, oh my God, I have been misled. Westmoreland, you're not getting 206,000 more troops. I'm going to call a bombing pause. I'm going to go to negotiations. And LBJ added on the 31st of March, 1968, I'm not going to run for re-election. Now, that was because the, the tide was turning. Bobby Kennedy was running against him. So was McCarthy. They were gathering all kinds of, he said, the war is lost. If I hadn't been lied to, if I believed those lies, I would have given Westmoreland 206 thousand more troops. He would have gone up through North Vietnam, up to China, for God's sake. So, no, no, I'm calling it quits. Now, I'm not suggesting anything. All I'm saying is that that experience came from the fact that Westmoreland lied to the president, just as one of his successors here, General Lloyd Austin, has lied to you about progress in, in Ukraine, and specifically telling uh, telling the CIA director and telling you that Putin had already lost in early July of last year. Does that strike you as odd? All of a sudden, Putin is going to win unless we give $61 billion. So in any words, you've been lied to, Mr. President. We know that because we've had that experience. We have no military analytic capability anymore in the CIA. That was ceded to the Pentagon, unfortunately, by Robert Gates. So what you're getting is unadulterated fixed intelligence from a guy named Austin, who, when he was CENTCOM commander, um, he had 50 analysts from intelligence analysts from CENTCOM and from the Defense Intelligence Agency file a formal complaint with the Pentagon IG saying Austin and the people around him were falsifying the intelligence to make it appear that the U.S. was doing a great job in Syria. And guess what? A year and a half later, um, the general who was doing this investigation, no, no, it was largely, no, no, it was largely not that. But it was that. That was unprecedented. 50 intelligence analysts. So the same thing has happened on Ukraine by the same guy. Yeah, and uh, the Bill, Bill Burns in the CIA doesn't have the kind of analytic capability anymore to challenge that, as we, back in the day, did have on Vietnam. So, Ray, I, I, I don't quite... We got uh, something missing here. We went from... Gaza now to Ukraine. I know you got your briefing prepared there, but you want me, and so basically you want me to threaten to pull aid from Netanyahu from Israel. That alone would destroy my election chance. But now the one thing I got against Trump is, you know, he's a, a Putin simp. So, you know, uh, you're now telling me that I should play ball with Putin. I should uh, give away the one strength here I got uh, with the, I don't want what you call them, the military industrial complex. I call them our national security apparatus. But there I, I, I got Trump against the wall because, you know, he, he wants to cause a lot of trouble for me with Israel. Uh, and he thinks he, oh yeah, he would be tougher than anybody. But on the Ukraine, that's all his problem, right? He created this. He was playing ball with, with Putin when he was president. Isn't that what your intelligence shows? Hello? You hear me, Ray? I can yeah. hear you, Bob, yeah. Yeah, we should have kept doing this in person, this thing about whatever we're using here now, trying to... What, are you working from home now, huh? 
Yeah. Everybody, mm -hmm. nobody came back to work. Yeah, you guys stay home all the time. So, where's that intern, Max? He's straighten us out, Ray. I can hear you. I don't know if the Max. Gotta, uh, we got to wrap this up anyway. I got a country to run here. Uh, but you, you, you want to wrap that up about what you're saying? So what? So, so you're telling me Ukraine's falling apart? What? Yeah. Uh, oh, it says we're live now. Okay. Yeah, uh, Mr. President, um, you know, it would be funny if it weren't so serious. I talked about the misleading intelligence that uh, General Austin or Secretary of Defense Austin has been giving. Uh, and uh, Bill Burns has been mouthing to the president to the point where you have been saying as July last year that Putin had already been defeated in Ukraine. Um, there was a CNN item over the weekend which speaks volumes. Okay, maybe, maybe just the, the, it was written by this General Ben Hodges. Uh, who used to command uh, NATO troops, American troops in Europe. And he's uh, one of the favorite CNN commentators. And the title speaks for itself. Here it is. We have, we have the arms uh, authorization. What is needed now is a strategy. We need a strategy now for Ukraine. Wow, strategy. So in other words, we have all these arms. We have to figure out how to do, how to use them. And this comes, you know, what, uh, two and a half years into the fray. So the experience on, on Ukraine, Mr. President, has been a woeful one. Uh, the intelligence you've been given has been given with a thought to ingratiate themselves with you. Uh, Ukraine is losing badly. There is no chance that the additional aid that has been approved will get there. And it will get there on time. And uh, when Putin goes to Beijing, and that will be, Putin will be going to Beijing, he said, in May, so within the next two weeks, he and Xi Jinping are going to be left to decide whether or not, uh, what to do with respect to Ukraine. Should they keep saying, as uh, the Russians keep saying, Let's negotiate. We're open to negotiation. Or should they go all the way to the Dnieper River and face face you with a total defeat in Ukraine um, before the election? So uh, the stakes are very high. You should just know that uh, the people running your policy toward Ukraine, especially the military leaders, have not been have not been honest with you. And you're facing another rock and a hard place there uh, with the proviso that nobody else probably tells you. Uh, but serious Russian leaders in every other speech they make say, let's negotiate. Let's negotiate. And the last time this came up, um, you know, this, the last time we were so close to World War Three and a nuclear kind of uh, exchange, was in 1962, and the big difference there, Mr. President, was we had open communications with the Russians. We were able to solve that. Kennedy and Khrushchev, it was a teletype in those days, but it worked, okay? Now, our fear is there's no communication with Russian leaders, and so when they, when they threaten, as they did this week, uh, to do exercises, with tactical nuclear weapons, uh, exercises by air and by sea. Now, our analysts will not be able to tell, well, is this the real deal or what, without that kind of secure communication. So this was unprecedented that the Russians would say, look, we're running exercises with non-strategic read tactical nuclear weapons. Now, if there's no way to communicate when those exercises start, what are the intelligence analysts in, in Europe and the United States going to think, oh, my God, this may be the real thing? And the real thing was threatened several times in the past. I could tell you a chapter and verse, and it was just by luck, mostly by luck, that the right people were in the right place and did the right thing and uh, turned the faucet off from nuclear war. 
Well, that's uh, that's all you got, Harry. Disaster in Gaza, and now a World War Three. If I don't go along with what capitulation, what are we supposed to do? I'm going to tell Congress you now uh, put up sixty what sixty one billion dollars, and that's not going to matter. Uh, how, how do I handle that one? You know, I well, get you know you don't give political advice, but you know the fact of the matter is uh, war, right? You know, see extension of politics, the failure yeah. of politics, whatever it is, you know, and we're in this crazy situation where I've given Israel everything they ever want for my whole political career. There's a report out now. I've got more money from what you call the Israel lobby uh, than any other politician it came out today. So I saw it, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, I get more than sure. I get more than anybody. You know, now I'm going to be accused of, of betraying Israel because I won't let them, uh, kill all these people or well i can't stop it and then on ukraine where the one issue i got is that you know trump's a sip of this guy putin and uh you know and i can hit him on that one and you're telling me no the, the money we sent what are they going to say it's not enough or it came too late is that what they've I already about? said it's, they've already said it's not enough they said it on day one uh, i have to tell you that when congress was briefed and by his own admission Mike Johnson's mind was changed, so he cast that one vote breaking the tie on further aid. Uh, he said, oh, he was convinced by the intelligence briefings. Uh, I have to tell you, Mr. President, those briefings did, come, did not come from professional intelligence analysts telling the truth. They came from the highest officials of the intelligence apparatus not telling the truth. And what I'm saying here is, this is not the first time this has happened. And the president has been misled, and so has the Congress. And pretty soon, uh, push will come to shove, and the Russians and the Chinese in the next couple of weeks will be deciding what to do about Ukraine because they hold the upper hand. And uh, one, one option that I don't think you've been uh, told about is take the Russians at their word, saying they're willing to talk about what happens in Ukraine, rather than have a complete embargo on uh, contacts between foreign ministers or uh, whatever. There's no nothing going on now, Mr. President, and that's, in our view, a very dangerous situation, and we've seen a lot of that in the past. Well, Ray, you know, I'm going to keep doing this with you because there is some small chance that what you're saying makes sense and so forth. But I'm getting a lot of advice here that we are going to turn that corner in Ukraine. I'm also getting a lot of advice here that, that BB will come to his senses and not let these, uh, whatever you call them, this more extreme uh, element there in Israel. Uh, you know, I used to hear BB was the extreme from the old Labor Party people, but now <laughs> you got these other people make BB look like a moderate. And uh, so I, I'm going to go, uh, you know, obviously you're not the only one I'm listening to. I got a whole staff here, State Department, Defense Department, everything else. But, you know, sometimes I think I just talk to you because it's amusing. You're an old timer. Sometimes I talk to you because, you know, hey, you have called it right in the past. And I, got, I need to hear this. That, that's what I know. I've been around a long time. No, I can be lied to by some of the best. So we'll keep doing it. But uh, try to look, try to listen to them a little more. You know, it's not like they don't know what they're talking about. They got a lot of information. And anyway, the media listens to them, whether I do or not. That's what the media listens to. And let me tell you, even the most respectable news organizations are going to tear me a new one if, if uh, you know, I don't hang in there on, on Ukraine and if I don't, if I break any kind of relation with Israel, which, you know, that's the third rail. We all know that. So let's call it a, a morning here, Ray. And, you know, but try to try to come in with a little more positive attitude the next time, okay? But, you know, I, I don't want to push. I, I, I respect 27 years is a long time that you put in there the CIA, and so i, I got to give it some little respect. All Mr. Right. President, if I could have a final word, uh, it's simply that uh, I don't normally quote things about uh, domestic intelligence or domestic polls. 
Uh, but there is the other side of this that I hope you are also aware of, and that is that the students on these campuses are making quite some headway to include articles in the New York Times of all places, uh, reflecting favorably on their persistence. The other thing is that I read in the news today that five battlefields or you know, battleground states are really uh, turning toward that other fellow with the orange hair. And uh, it's because of uh, the policy on uh, genocide in Gaza. So that's the other side of it. Uh, you, you, may, uh, you may get lots of support, and you do, of course. You're distinguished for getting the most support from the Israel lobby. But there's this other support that uh, you have to think about. You're losing that. And you're losing that very quickly. Uh, and I, I ask your forgiveness for co commenting on domestic politics like this, but that needs to be mentioned as a balance uh, for your decision making. Again, as to whether you make the telephone call or not, that's really up to you. Uh, I, I dare say it will, it will be on your conscience no matter whether you make the call or you don't. You know, Ray, I'm going to end this now, but let me just tell you uh, what happened there with Lyndon Johnson using that example and everything. You had Richard Nixon, who, you know, he looks like a, a pinko pacifist now by comparison to this version of Trump. Trump can come at you a lot of different ways. He could talk about, he could sit down with the leader of North Korea and make peace or something. But on the other hand, I, I show any weakness here. That's the trap here, right? Think about that until we have a, 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 this week. We're kind of back to a weekly meeting because I can't put this kind of time in there. But when I see you next Monday, uh, you know, think about that. That's really the dilemma. Uh, you know, that uh, if, if Trump plays that hard line, then sure, if he came out and said, yeah, I could just settle this, I'll go talk to this, and I will. I'll raise the question that he was willing to talk to the North Koreans and even crossed over that line, went into their territory. My God, that's Donald Trump. So there's a couple of different Donald Trumps. But if he just comes at me with this, you know, like he's uh, going to make more better than I can, uh, you know, I got answers on that one, you know, certainly on the Ukraine. And, uh, and I know, Ray, you just don't want Donald Trump to be president. So and. Uh, even the New York Times, they sure don't want him to be. So, you know, I, I, it's you don't understand that whole world. That's what we got the lesser evil going here. And that's something I, you'll have to trust me. I know how to do that. I don't need the CIA to tell me how to play the lesser evil card. But anyway, I'm just being friendly and honest with you because I do respect your service. And uh, But, you know, my patience is getting a little thin here. So try to come back with a more a positive thing, uh, you know, uh, what we can do going forward. Okay, that's it. Where's that guy?